uh, welcome everyone. Thank you everyone for joining this session with, uh, with us. So this is, so the session which we are having today is Achieving Business Agility with Value Stream Management by um, Al Shadowway. Great. Well, it's glad to be here. Um, you may have noticed this is not a PowerPoint slide. Hey, what's going on? So here, I'll put this in the chat. This is a mural board. And for the last couple of months, I've been starting to use this board. Uh, you can get in it yourself and look around or you can follow my presentations. And this will stay live for a while where you can ask questions. Uh, you should have, if you're going to navigate it yourself, it's good to get this on the left and this on the bottom. If you don't have that, it's easy to get. You should have actually gotten instructions when you came in, but sometimes it looks kind of like this. And the way if you're here, you just click these double arrows here and click this. And now you have a navigation method. And that's what I'm going to go through and do. And the link is down in the chat. Now, the reason I do this is because this enables you to look around as you want. I would prefer you pay attention to me, of course, but if you have questions, you could also put comments in here and I'll get to them later. And this is a live document. I now do all my training this way. As was mentioned, I'm now with Success Engineering, a new company I've formed. I'm no longer with the PMI, but I still do disciplined agile value stream consultant training. So I'm gonna have a lot of quotes by Don Reinertsen. Uh, if I mention his name, it came from this book. Uh, but here's another interesting quote that we sometimes seem to forget in the agile world. Everybody talks, <clears throat> excuse me, everybody talks about how we all need to do our best and we're all motivated and things of that nature, but we also have to know what to do. Uh, I'm somewhat distressed to be candid that uh, methods like Scrum are, in my mind, too simple and don't give a lot of information that people need to recreate. There's no reason to recreate things now. 20 years ago, we did not know a lot about how to do things. We know a lot now, but I go into many, many teams and they have no clue. People are reinventing much of the practices and thinking in Agile. Um, so uh, so that's, that's an issue, I think, in, in this. Uh, the, the message, by the way, was in the chat. This is the last time I'll mention that. And maybe some Megana you could put in and answer those chat questions about how to get here. Okay, uh, I've put it in the chat box again. So, um, yeah, very good. Thank you. Okay. The chat box. Yeah. Now I'm planning to go through this talk in about 30 to 35 minutes and have questions at the end. But you can be adding questions in, uh, on the board itself. You can, you can use here, this on the bottom, rather. This is a way to add a comment. The easiest way to add comments is actually just right click where you want it to go and say add comment, or you can put a chat in the Miro chat. Anyway, if we're going to talk about business agility, let's get clear what we mean. It's the ability of an organization to deliver value quickly, sustainably, predictably, and with high quality. And it needs to be consumed by the customer, not merely delivered. There's an old phrase called shelfware where we delivered it, but nobody used it. That's not that's not sufficient. This focus on delivery is wrong. It has to be on consumption. Uh, all too often you see software go out that has not considered support, has not considered marketing. And that's because the focus is on delivery instead of consumption. If I've got to go back to software for since 1970 when I started college. And when I became a professional in the 80s and 90s, there was a focus on code complete. And then it became, okay, tested code. And then it became uh, delivered code. And now it has to be consumed. That's what our focus needs to be. So let's, let's consider something about what a system is, because I want to give an overall view of things. And what we have in creating products or what I just call knowledge work, because sometimes we're doing, we're not really building a product. So uh, Don Reinertsen talks a lot about, he uses a phrase, product development, and, and it's as applicable to what I'm talking about as my phrase, knowledge work, but sometimes we're not building products. We're trying to solve particular problems or other things. So I'm using a broader term, but a system is not a collection of components. It's defined by the relation between the components. Consider if you took the best parts of the best cars and put them together, you'd have a pile of junk. You wouldn't have a car. Systems live as a whole of all the pieces, not as the pieces put together. And we seem to forget this because 
we started agile kind of at the team level and now are saying, oh, we can, uh, uh, we can put these pieces together, but we can, it's not a good system if we do that. And in fact, at the end, when I talk about how we actually do this, we'll see this is actually bad thinking. Um, in fact, I would suggest that moving to agile solved one of the main problems, which was go smaller, go faster, but it left the structure of the organization that does it in a simplistic uh, way. And we have to take a next leap forward, which is what basically I'll be talking about here and what I'm doing at Success Engineering. Okay, so optimizing the components of a system literally destroy the end objectives of the system. Um, and that, in other words, let's say we optimized an engine on an airplane and made it have, made it bigger and more ca capable. Well, it might make the engine too heavy. It might not be controllable. You cannot look at individual pieces. You've got to look at the whole. And basically, a system without it must have an aim. Without an aim, there is no system. In other words, the system aligns around it. It's not the individual pieces working together. It's everybody working toward the system. There's actually another way if you do that, that's kind of interesting. I'm going to go into this mode, it's called presentation mode. It gives a slightly bigger screen and now looks a little bit more slide-like as well. Okay, so, and here's, I'll just show you how to make a, see, I right-clicked it, add comment. It's as easy as that. Okay, anyway, coming back. So I wanna start with the inherent problem we have. Our inherent problem is imagine, we don't really have corn silos here, but. You know, we have the customer and we do some requests and it goes into say marketing and then decides to go into portfolio management and then development or whatever. So this is kind of what we call the value stream, all the steps of work from when we get the idea. Now the customer may not give us the idea. That might be something somebody in the company figures out, uh, but it's on behalf of the customer. So when we talk about it, an idea starting with a customer, we're saying that figuratively. We're not saying it's exactly, it's on their behalf, however. So it goes across and we're organized in silos. But what we want to consider is what's going on when this happens, uh, when we're organized in silos. We might be very efficient in this silo and very efficient in this silo and very efficient in this silo, but work tends to accumulate between the silos because this silo is done, that silo is busy working on something else. So what we have is we get these delays, we get this work in the silos. And this is an interesting quote by Reinertson. He says in product development or knowledge work, our greatest waste is not unproductive engineers, but work products sitting island in process queues. See, it's very busy inside here, no work. The work is waiting between these two. This is a big problem. And the big issue here is this, as work waits here, it causes waste. And the reason it causes waste is we lose knowledge the knowledge gets old. And if the mistake is made here and it's got to go through all this and waiting in the silos, even though it's busy here and busy here and busy here, this slow feedback causes a lot of problems. In fact, I would suggest this, feed, this slow feedback is a bigger problem than complexity because we make little mistakes, but by the time they get here, they're very big. It's what's called a nonlinear event. A little thing causes a big problem. The straw that broke the camel's back is a great example of it. So this has been around a long time. It's biblical. You know, it's the idea that I make a small mistake now, it gets big consequences later. That's what I mean by a nonlinear event. That's actually much worse a situation than complexity itself. And we're actually set up to do this in, in many ways. Um, so we have to somehow manage the system. It doesn't manage itself left to themselves. Components become selfish, independent profit centers and destroy the system. The secret is cooperation between components toward the aim of the organization. I kind of like the outline here, so I'm gonna go back to this. Um, so what we are set up for though, is to optimize locally, managing each of the pieces locally when we need to look at the whole system because locally, none of these pieces are going to optimize themselves. So this is our inherent problem. We manage one way. We're not managing the system per se, we're managing the individual pieces of the system and this causes competition, which you see. Now, I'll make a quote, I'll, I'll make a little note of who Edwards Deming is. Deming is an American who helped the United States in the war effort, World War II, 
And uh, he and Stuart were two key pieces on this improving quality and production capacity. And after Japan uh, was taken over, you know, MacArthur was the commanding general of the occupying forces of, of in Japan. He brought Deming out to Japan to help build radios because the infrastructure was killed. And um, they basically, the Japanese saw how good his methods were. They brought him out later in the early 50s, I think it was, to help them just get better. And that's how Deming became known in Japan. And Deming is somewhat considered the person who taught the Japanese quality. And he's slow to be adopted by the United States. But here's, here's the thing we're talking about. I'm going to go back to this picture here. And then see what we have is if we have these silos, consider what a silo looks like. You have managers managing the people in the silos and they're seeing if they're productive, if they're working on the right thing, if they're working with good quality. And Lean actually suggests a big shift in, in Agile, from Agile, um, in, in that it actually from manufacturing everything, is we shift our focus from people to the workflow. Instead of looking at the people, say, in the silo, and seeing where, where they are in, in what they're doing, we have to shift to how is the work going? It's natural to see if people are productive and working on the right things, but this won't solve our problem because that's a local shift. We must shift to productivity from productivity to speed of delivery. Again, operating a product development process near full capacity is an economic disaster. This is from Reinertsen. Um, so we have a lot of shifts. And at first, this looks counterintuitive. Wait, 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 you mean we're going to look at the work? We're not going to look at the people? But I thought our people are our best, best thing, our best, um, you know, uh, the, the important part in the company. And it is true. Okay, it is counterintuitive. But it's actually, when you think about it, you can understand it a little better. So I want to think about it just a little bit here. So... If we trust our people, we shouldn't have to manage them. We want them to be in a great work environment. Deming suggests 96% of our errors come from the system, not the people. So focus on the system. There's another way of saying this, two other ways. A bad system will be, that's supposed to be beat a good person every time. See, this call, cool. I could actually, should be able to, but, you know, the, the will beat a good person every time. Um, so, but also then there are a lot of reasons. So 96% of our errors come from the system. Almost all of our errors, the reasons for the errors are deficiencies in the system rather than the employee. So this is the number of errors that actually occur. And then they look at, look at the number of reasons it's still predominant. The role of management is to change the process rather than to change the system, or excuse me, rather than to badger the employee. Okay improve the process. Now we use the people as well have to, it's not that they mandate it. It's important that, it's important that um, management works with the people. Okay. So we're going to trust people to do their best. That being said, you still need to give them the information they need to make good decisions. The, this notion of just delegating is insufficient. It's one of the reasons Agile gets themselves, people following Agile purely in the sense of, oh, they're autonomous, let them self-organize. Well, you know what? Maybe they don't know how. Maybe they don't know how they fit into the rest of the organization. What information do they need to be able to do that? And um, that's, that's an important consideration because an example is something Don Reinertsen talks about in building the 777, Boeing, when they built the 777. They had uh, cost and weight trade-offs. Uh, the heavier plane is, the more expensive it is to fly. So if you could actually lower the weight on an airplane, that's a good thing. But how much? How do you make that decision? How much are you willing to do in a trade-off? So you, he talked about how you had to give people the right information to make good decisions. So it's not simply defer the decisions it, or, or delegate the decisions. It's important to give people the information they need to make good decisions. Okay. Now I've talked about delays, but that's only part of it. Okay. So see delays in the workflow are obviously bad because they delay the delivery of things, but it's worse than that because you delay feedback. Okay. Uh, requirements are done, but not used, which means they get old. Okay. 
codes are written but not tested until after a delay. It's harder to find, so it takes more time. If you're not a developer, this is a funny phenomenon that you only get from being a developer. I, I haven't seen people who understand this if they've never written code. But if you write a bug, and believe me, the developers do write the bugs. Um, they, they talk about it like somebody else put them in or testing broke their code, but the developers are putting the bugs in. We don't mean to, but it happens. If you write a code one day and you actually find it that day, you'll fix it quickly. But if you don't find it for a week or two, it could take you hours or days to find it, even if nothing else changed. So as you have delays between writing bugs and finding them, it takes work, waste is work. Sometimes someone's needed, but not available. So these delays in workflow create much more waste than really the delay of the product. In other words, a delay of an hour could cause an extra hour or two of extra work. This all ripples through. So you really have problems with delays and we need to recognize that this is our enemy is the delays. Now, a side effect of delays is the fact that the work they create is never planned for. So we have this unplanned work. We didn't plan it, we didn't think about it. It probably should be planned for, but it isn't. And the more delays in the workflow, the less certain our schedules. And this in turn causes more delays because we schedule things to be available and they're not. So we have to wait for people. So we wanna start attending to these delays between work steps, which is again, like in a system, it's really the relationships between the components. That's the big thing. Okay. Now, how do we do this? Well, one way first is at a global level, I, you know, I should say uh, global is maybe the wrong word, holistic level, manage what goes into development. In other words, don't give developers too much to do because then they won't be overloaded. You can also, uh, you can look at how much is being done. Uh, look at the big picture of the work being done. Now, Goldrad, who was the creator of the theory of constraints, said, indicated how important this was by saying often reducing batch size is all it takes to bring a system back into control. A lot of people nowadays in Agile talk about complexity and is it complex, complicated, simple, et cetera, et cetera. I actually think that's a little bit misgiven. We're complex. Look, we're definitely a complex system. If, if you have people, you're complex. It's as simple as that. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, but what you want to know is what you deal with it. You don't need to navigate it so much as know is what causes greater chaos or, or complexity. And the more things you have in, the more things in play, the harder it is to see what's going on. So one thing you can do is lower the number of things going in, okay? Okay. So value streams, I haven't quite defined what they are, is the work flowing across the organization. We actually call these workflows at Success Engineering. It's a better metaphor. It's not a linear little narrow uh, stream, but I'm gonna continue calling them value streams here because that's within the title. So they're not the people doing the work, but rather the workflow itself. Talking about value streams as people takes our focus off what we should be looking at. And this is one of the reasons I don't like talking about it that way, although SAFE does. I think it takes away some of their power. Uh, we want to avoid value streams crossing each other. This happens when people are in multiple value streams. And if we talk about stable value streams, uh, if we talk about stable value streams in this way, then even I might have several people and several value streams, but they're in their stable. And it says, oh, look, I got these people and they're in the same value streams. But it's not a good way to talk about it. Think of the workflow. And when they cross by having multiple people in them, then, then that's not so good, okay? So what goes into it? This is kind of at an abstract level. The way to manage value streams, conceptually anyway, is what goes into it, the size of the items, how many you have is important, how people are organized. That's called the value creation structure. I'll add some references to this. So take note of the, of the mirror board and I'll add, there's, there's several good books now uh, on this and I don't have a reference in this talk, but I'll add it. Uh, workflow methods are important. In other words, you do uh, test first, specification by example, automated testing. Alignment is important. You know, can we see how, how people are working together? We want also small items that people will work on in an aligned manager. So there's this question, how do you get small items? And this is again, where I think we've gone a little off, off the rails uh, in that, in that um, MVPs are invoked, which is good. The minimum viable product, Eric Reese is using that and that's good, but it can be used 
and it is used to determine if you have a product, but MVPs are not intended to manage the enhancements of a large system. MVPs should not be used with time boxing. Time boxing is when you're looking out ahead and you're saying, hey, we've got this, what are we gonna do? Well, if you're trying to discover if you have a product, you don't really know what you're gonna do. That's the whole idea of, of the thing. So, um, uh, so we wanna really look at, uh, we wanna really look at, uh, not MVPs for when we're enhancing logic, we need something else. And we, what we, we call this a minimum business increment. The heritage of MBIs comes from the minimum marketable feature, which by the way, is not what is used in SAFE. I don't know why they repurposed MMF, which isn't in Lean UX either. Uh, but the minimum business increment is the idea of the smallest chunk of value that we can give to a customer where they, they consume it. Okay. And we should use both MVPs and MBIs when appropriate. We ha I have other talks on this in detail. Um, I'll add a reference to this as well. Uh, I'm going to make a note, add reference to the MBIs and books. Easy to do. So you can come back later and you'll see that. I did see somebody question about Mick Kirsten's stuff. Mick's work project to product is brilliant. And his flow metrics, I mean, I got to give Mick credit. They're brilliant, but they're really just a rebranding of lean metrics. Um, so I, I don't mean that in a negative way. I think it's brilliant stuff. Uh, Project to Product by Mick Kirsten is really good. Um, MBIs are more though just about value increments. This is something that we have added. This is a unique thing of MBI say versus MMFs. And I've been trying to get for about a, a decade people to follow this. And some people have. I've had a lot of people come to me and say, you know, we use the MBI concept and transformed our whole company off that one concept. Because it also is how... What do we need? What are all the people we need to get it out the door? What's the marketing? What's the documentation? What's the support? And we can create them by saying, how can we deliver this piece soonest? So we do that to some extent, market segments, language, things of that sort. But it creates a way to implement an initiative by doing a little bit at a time. And then also by saying, these are the people that are needed. So we can get basically a better team structure. I'm not saying reorganize things every time, I'm not going back to projects, but what are the people at least know that we may not reorganize, but at least we know who we need to get the thing done. So what we wanna do is step back, let's just do a quick summary and then I'll get into this slide. We said, we've got to look at the entire value stream. We've got to attend to delays. We wanna look at small things. We wanna look at our team structure. But obviously, if we have limited amount of work we're doing at any one time, we're trying to deliver faster. Uh, this the MBIs are about delivering quicker, not less. We do quicker pieces. Okay, what's value? So the customer's value stream, in other words, we have our development value stream, but we call the customer's value stream their operational value stream. It's how they do their operations. By the way, the customer could be an internal person uh, or group, and then that's the internal operations of a company. So how the operational value stream and the development value stream interact is called the customer journey. In other words, how do they, maybe not, that's maybe worded poorly. How, that should be how the operational value stream and our system interact, not the development value stream. In other words, the journey is they do this, they do this, they do this on our system. Notice the, they do some things outside of the journey. So the operational value stream is their full path the customer journey is how they manage through our system. And we should look to see how the way we define the customer journey can positively impact the operational value stream. Or sometimes you go just the opposite. You look at what would make for an efficient, effective operational value stream. And then we create our system to improve the customer journey. I'll give a quick example of this. Um, everybody kind of thinks this is funny for some reason, but back in the 80s and 90s, I used to work in the hair salon business. I wrote software for hair salons. I had written a system using touch screens. This is all on DOS and it was really brilliant UX besides I will say so. Back in those days, a lot of people had never touched computers before and hairstylists aren't rocket scientists when it comes to, to computers. Now I love hair, I love the business. And I love the people in the business, but they're very, they are very artistic. They're not necessarily that logical. And we'd created a system where they could just, it took them 15 minutes and they were trained basically in how to use appointments and all sorts of stuff, it was brilliant. But part of it was because we considered how they worked. And one of the ways they worked, if you've ever been at a front desk of a major 
high-end salon like in Aveda. They were one of our clients. It's crazy up there. And we looked at that craziness. We observed how they worked at their operational value stream. And we came up with what are now known as function keys. Everybody has them. But back in the 80s, it wasn't the constant. Everybody used menus back then. And we had a system that used menus or function keys or ops or commands. And the function keys then became the customer journey. But the way they used the customer journey was their operational value stream. So this is a really powerful technique. Um, this can be a very powerful technique to step back and consider this, okay? So what we want to do, this is a little repeat, what goes in, the size and how much and what the quality is, attend to the way people are organized, attend to the workflow. This at a high level is what we want to look at. Now, Agile is good. I mean, I've been around in Agile since 99 when I learned XP. And uh, I was at the second Snowbird 10. I was not at the original Snowbird. Uh, that's where the Agile Manifesto was created. They called it Snowbird because it was in the Snowbird Ski Resort. I was at Agile 10, which was 10 years later, held in the same place. And there's no question we've moved forward, but we've moved forward by working smaller teams and smaller pieces. But I would suggest we've got the wrong paradigm still because the argument, should we start bottom up, top down, or both, is based around hierarchies of management instead of do we attend to the value stream? We want to get away from hierarchies. See, this is the point. Hierarchies are in silos. Blockages in the value stream are often caused upstream, but merely putting less into it doesn't work if you're using ineffective methods behind. It will be useful, but here, I'll, I'll jump back to this. See, if we improve what goes in here, that might help because you won't overload this, but you've got to change this whole structure. So what we want to get to is this new way of thinking that we're going to look at the entire value stream because fixing a piece of it and thinking in terms of hierarchies is the wrong mindset. So starting a portfolio management may help. Starting at the bottom may help, but the relationship between the parts is what's really important. So we need to start looking at value streams. And this is um, a, a challenge we have because most everybody says, oh, we start with Scrum. And, and the problem is it doesn't include management. It actually teaches teams to self-optimize, locally optimize. And then they have to unlearn that later when they have to learn how to work together. And once you've learned how to be fast and efficient, you don't want to learn how to go slower because you feel your team is more important than the whole. And that's not true, but that's how it feels. It often is done by creating cross-functional teams. I've seen this literally hurt the organization because the people that make the cross-functional teams to create the scrum teams are taken away from other people in the organization. This is very done when it's a test. And say, oh, let's create a scrum team and we'll try things out. But they don't realize they're hurting the rest of the organization. And it doesn't address the real issue of getting value delivered to the customer. It doesn't look at the whole picture. And it doesn't recognize that intra-team relationships are not the same as inter-team relationships. So the pieces of the whole, the teams need to fit, need to be structured in the context of the whole, okay? The structure of an isolated autonomous team does not exist in a medium to large size company. This is the big myth. Oh yeah, let's create these isolated teams and then let's scatter them throughout the, it doesn't work because you got ops, you got sales, you got all sorts of stuff. What you do want to do is have the idea of smaller organizations, like um, to have entrepreneurial, entrepreneurships, entrepreneurial or microcosm, microcosmic. So instead of having a thousand person company made up of of like a, a 10, 100 person things, have more smaller pieces where the, peop, the teams are not maybe purely autonomous, but the collection of small teams is. So there are other structures that are, that are available. Okay. I'm gonna try to wrap this up so we have time for questions. I'm getting pretty close, but I'm about five minutes behind. That's not so bad, given it's a new talk. Um, Starting at the team is not always ideal. I have seen that it's sometimes best to create a system. Like remember one of the ways, I, I used to do SAFE, I don't anymore because I think what I have is much better. But when I did SAFE, I would actually create the structure that multiple teams could work in. It was a lot easier to teach them teams at that point. System providing the proper work area to the teams. How do they get what they're working on? Uh, you can't just start at the low level, essential SAFE because you, everybody needs portfolio management. So starting at the bottom does not provide that to people. Again, a holistic needed. Now, I would suggest the frameworks don't really work, that they teach you learning the framework 
and they teach you, te if they're complicated or big, then they teach you parts of it. And although there are similar issues, the, their value streams are unique. So you, they need to be contextualized. Now, value stream mapping creates visibility. Here was a simple value stream map I used in 2006. My very first, well, I didn't use it. This was the, the company, my very first uh, training of a lean software development workshop. And we had sales development deployment the, and it worked brilliantly. Actually, we found the problem here. We did five whys on this and I'll, I'll put the reference to the article. When we did the five whys, we found the problem wasn't in development. This showed that every now and then we had to loop back and fix something after it was deployed. The problem was actually in sales. And when we asked, why are we going back here? It was things weren't being properly configured because sales hadn't told people that. I won't tell you the whole story because I'm running behind, but I will put this reference in here that you can read it online. But the point is, so I, I started out, wow, value streams, awesome. But then after a while, I found out that it was expensive and rarely done well because I'd go into a place and they wouldn't take the time or have all the people they needed to do it. So what I was left with, what I was left with was a poor value stream. I came up with this concept of uh, Kanban bars are like value stream apps where you have columns instead of boxes and arrows and that helped, but it wasn't enough. And after struggling for a few years, and I'd interviewed literally hundreds of consultants and change agents, the so things that worked and didn't work. What I noticed was that pretty much there was a core set of things that everybody had to do. And that, and that if you had FDA regulation, Federal Drug Administration in the US, um, if you had that, you had hardware, software, there were some others, but that you could actually see what was needed. And what we came up with was a way to contrast what you had to do conceptually. Am I doing like good portfolio management? So it, or am I doing good intake process? So instead of looking at just delays, which is what value stream management, I looked at the objectives of what was going on and found this worked as well with, um, well, almost as well, with significantly less effort. So it's kind of like the Pareto principle. So in the Disciplined Agile Value Stream Consultant Workshop, that's actually what we do. We don't teach value stream mapping, but we teach how to use this idealized value stream map. See how you do against that. It gives you almost all the information you need at a fraction of the cost. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, the way to start is identify value stream to improve. You look at small things. Um, and this is some advice from Reinertsen, and I agree, okay, you know, reduce batch size. It's cheaper. Management likes saying, oh, we don't have to hire more people, but it, it, it lowers the delay. So it's a good starting point. Okay. That's actually it. The, I think this, I think the next two slides I had were actually just a little bit more notes about uh, this is about company, but let's just stop here. So I'm gonna go through the Q&A and chat. Um, uh, I go through that actually quick. But if you need to get a hold of me, this is how uh, Success Engineering works. That's my company. And you could click here, I'm not going to do it, but you can learn more about our collaborative engagements. We don't use PowerPoint. We don't tell you what to do. We actually work interactively with a company or with a team on, on doing things, okay. Okay, so I, I see something from Bob and how to implement systems, value shift streams when you're a service provider, different services to different customers or needs are different. Um, well, I guess I'm not totally clear on, on the question. You, you would, you would attend to uh, each of those has to be a different capability. You have to consider how would I build a system that, how would I build a system that um, uh, does that and what, people are needed for that. So when you build the system that provides these services, you would look at it holistically. Again, look at all the needs. And then actually at MBI might be, this is one kind of service I provide. This is another kind of service I provide and things of that, of that nature. Okay, I'm gonna look at the chat and then I'll look at the board. I didn't notice if anybody had actually entered something on the board. Okay, well, are there questions? Please. Um, Please ask questions. I'm going to look to see if anybody's added something on the board as well. See, this is cool, but I don't think anybody There's one has. more question, Al, um, from Sonia. 
So uh, uh, they ask, they are asking, how do we tie strategic uh, slash uh, value streams? That's a great question. That's a really good question because there's actually, uh, <laughs> you know, I wish I could say I knew it all. <laughs> That'd be a lie. <laughs> And the reason I'm laughing is because this question just nailed something that I realized about three months ago, and I don't have it in my materials, but I will talk to it because it's such a great question. Because one of the things we tend to think about is that strategy is part of our value stream, and it isn't. It's a separate, it's a separate value stream. And I want to pull this up and show that. Uh, so really great question. Thank you so much for it. See here, we're talking about the value stream of like, I got the customers and we're working on it. And this is actually when something comes in and we decide if we're going to do it and all that. Now, if you step back and think about it, that means we've already got our strategy. Well, the figuring the strategy is not in this value stream. We already have that. What we don't have is uh, what we do have to put in here is how do we fit this in that strategy? So what you're asking for is how do we figure out that strategy that influences this? At least I think that's what you're asking. Uh, and you can confirm that in the Q&A uh, if, if, if I got it right, to stop me if I have it wrong. But then what that means is somewhere we need another value stream called let's calculate our strategy. And the customer of that value stream is actually the company. In other words, we have to have a strategic, create the strategic value stream, create the strategy value stream that is used to create the context for this. Now, how to do that is, uh, is something that I've done for quite some time. And ironically, I've never, <laughs> I've never totally documented it. We talk a little bit about it in the Discipline Agile Value Stream Consultant Workshop, and um, we have a community of practice. And I'm planning to write it up, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you quickly the concept of strategies is um, what you want to have happen is that the people who are responsible for it, leadership, executives, et cetera, you want them to consider what does it mean for the company to be successful? And we call the things to look at investment pillars. In other words, what are you going to invest in to make the company successful? And an investment pillar for, say, a company that helped people do finances could be like, well, what we want to do is lower costs. We want to, or rather the first one might be, we'll do whatever we can to retain customers. Because if we retain customers, we retain assets and we make more money based on how many assets we have. So retain customers might be one, retain assets might be another. Compliance with regulation could be a third. Uh, lower our costs could be another one. So we look at these four or five, you don't need more than five. Uh, what are the main investment pillars we invest in. And then you could rate these. Well, retaining customers is twice as important as lowering your costs uh, or whatever. You decide on this. And now what you have is you have basically the reasons for investing and you have a, uh, a measure of which ones are more important. And then when you do portfolio management, you can look, well, this compared to that, uh, well, how does it go to the investment pillars? And you could literally do a comparison this way uh, we had years ago created a, 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 an Excel sheet that did this. Um, uh, that's not being made available right now outside, but uh, my company is going to rebuild that thing because it's, uh, it's an old concept. Other people have used it. It can be used with, if you're familiar, weighted shortest job first. I'll add that as a reference. But that's a way of figuring out what to do based on delay thinking and value. Um, you could literally use this balance of investment pillars as a way of uh, seeing what's more valuable than the others. Okay, any other questions? Yes, there's one more from Nagesh Chen. So value stream is great for existing work, but what about completely new initiatives? How do you define the initial value stream for things, which were never possible? Like there are no existing operational value streams. Okay, that's great. So, so here you got an interesting issue because you're actually creating the operational value streams of the new product. So I would suggest there are two aspects. Wonderful question. One thing is it, you still should have this focus on, on what value is. Um, uh, 
Oh, this one right here. You still want to look at this, except now we don't have a customer. We're trying to make a customer. So what we want to look at is what do we think their value stream would look like, how their operations would look like. We should still be thinking from their perspective. So now you could say, yeah, but we've never built this before. See, but a, a, a development value stream can be reasonably stable even when it's different, even when it's something new. However, consider this. You can have different kinds of typical value stream. So if I'm doing something that I've been doing for years and years, I see my operational, excuse me, I see my development value stream, I see how to build it. I probably work in a different way than if I'm building a brand new product, as you mentioned, but you will still have a value stream. So you still know you need to, to do something. Um, it's kind of like, what would a value stream for building an MVP look like versus what would a value stream for an MBI look like? And it's again, an interesting question. In an MVP, you're going to take smaller pieces. You're probably going to have more of a flow model because you don't want to wait a week or two to get feedback. You're going to want to go faster. So you still know a lot about past innovation. So another question, I can answer your question with a question. Hey, I am a consultant, right? Uh, <laughs> that's a joke. But I could say, what would be an effective value stream for creating new products? And then how do I create that? I can say right now, well, we're going to incrementally build in a flow model to determine what's necessary. Okay, so hopefully that helps out a bit. Great question again. These are great questions. Any other quite great questions? Or even lousy questions. <laughs> it doesn't look like it, but I'll use this last minute for something else. So look, this was a talk I have never given before. And notice what I did. We are right on time to end. How did I do that? See, Agile, talking about you can't do schedules in Agile. No, I adjusted my space. I adjusted my depth. I was continuously adjusting to the deadline of now. So thank you for being here. Stay safe. I hope you learned something. Please ask, continue to ask questions and make comments on the board. It's a live board. You can't change it, but I will be adding things to it. That's where to look for more information about me and more information where I said I'd add references. Thanks and take care.